Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Prudential's webinar, where today we're going to have a discussion on South African fixed income assets. Is it a safe haven or are there some challenges ahead? We were very fortunate to have over 500 participants at our webinar a couple of weeks ago. And today, again, we're expecting more than 500 people at today's webinar. So from my side, thank you very much for your support. With me today, I've got Prudential's Head of Fixed Income, Gareth Byrne, who will be discussing some of the fixed income instruments and will, is here to answer some of your questions. Morning, everyone. Thank you very much for those of you who sent through your questions beforehand. We'll try and discuss as much as possible of those and we've received them ahead of time and, and prepared some graphs for you. You're also welcome to send through more questions as we go along in the chat box. We've got some of Gareth's colleagues here today who will help answer these questions as we go along. And at the end, we'll also address some questions as we go further. So before we start and in getting into what has happened during the last couple of months in the world, maybe it's interesting to first look at the fixed income toolkit and all the various instruments you guys have at your disposal at which to build fixed income portfolios. We've had a number of clients ask us questions about what are all the fixed, various fixed income instruments and how do they diversify each other? Sure, Peter. Um, clearly, I mean, when people normally think of fixed income instruments, they, they normally just think cash or bonds. And, and I guess that's, that's very simplistic um, to look at it. And my first response is generally, well, what type of cash instruments are you talking about and what type of bonds are you talking about? Um, I, I like to tease my equity colleagues that equities are simple. Um, a share is a share is a share. There's not very much difference between them. They all operate the, the same way and anyone can understand a share. Um, when you get to the fixed income market, instruments are far more complex. Um, and you know, a, a, sh a bond is not a bond and cash is not a cash. Every bond has different terms, different um, structures. Um, you really need to be pretty smart to operate in the fixed income meetings or in the fixed income markets, um, should I say. Um, so we've got a, a graphic up um, on screen here. Um, and just for the audience, the, the graph that I'm looking at is behind the, the camera. So that's where I'll, I'll be looking. Um, and on this graph, we just have tried to categorize some of the fixed income instruments um, into uh, across two different levers, essentially, that you've got in the fixed income um, universe to drive your returns. So on the, the one axis, the, the Y axis, you'll see we've got credit risk running from low to high. And then on the, the bottom, the x-axis, we've got interest rate sensitivity. And by that, we mean how sensitive the instruments are to changes um, in interest rates. And so we've categorized a, a number of different fixed income instruments um, across these two categories. And if we just run through those, we'll get a sense of, of where these different instruments sit within these different risk scales. So if you just look to the right of that, that graph where we've got government bonds, essentially you're taking, in, taking on very little credit risk with those instruments. Um, but the interest rate sensitivity can vary. So you've either got some short dated bonds where the um, sensitivity interest rates will be relatively low, but obviously the, bond, the bonds go out um, many years. So the longest dated bonds in the local markets go to 2050. And obviously those instruments are going to be a lot more sensitive to interest rate moves and the pricing of those instruments will clearly be much more volatile. Um, then as we move up, um, you'll see that the credit risk starts increasing. So we've, we've put state-owned enterprises in as kind of a, a next layer up from when you're going from um, government um, bonds, and that would be government guaranteed bonds or some of the um, ungaranteed government guaranteed SOE bonds, but where the shareholder is actually the government. And so you're taking on for those instruments, you're taking on a bit more credit risk as well as liquidity risk, so it's not um, as liquid, and you're getting paid some more. But again, those instruments can be very short or very long. On the, the left, sort of in the middle of the, the chart, you'll see a number of money market stroke cash instruments. And these are the type of instruments you'll generally find in um, income funds, uh, money market, well, not necessarily money market funds, but the income sphere of the fixed income universe. And in that, we've put floating rate notes, bank NCDs, step rate notes, which are essentially notes where the, the rate you get paid steps up over time, as long as you don't put it back to the bank. And then credit linked notes. And I know there have been some questions on credit linked notes, but essentially what a credit linked note is, a note issued by a bank. But importantly here, the credit risk is related to another entity. Um, and so although the bond is issued or the, the note is issued by the bank, um, you're looking at taking on the risk to another entity. And it's important for investors to understand what risk they're assuming there. And clearly that credit risk can vary depending on the entity you're taking risk to. And then lastly, just note that, um, well, sorry, as we move across then, 
You've also got investment grade bonds where you're taking on some additional default risk, but you can pay an additional um, premium. And your sensitivity then to interest rates can vary because corporates issue um, short-term bonds as well as long data bonds. And if you think of investors, they're prepared to long lend to good quality corporates. They're prepared to lend them for short periods if need be, but also take a much longer view on them. Whereas if you move up to the, the last quadrant there where you'll see at the top there, we've got high yield bonds, which there aren't very many in the SA market, mm -hmm. clearly or sure they are, um, and preference shares. There, the risk is much higher. The risk of default is much higher in those instruments because the, the companies are a lot more risky, um, but you're getting paid for that risk. And generally, if you think about um, how long, given that the country or the companies are a lot more risky, how long would you be prepared to lend to them? Generally, it's a bit shorter, and which is why the high yield bonds generally are, are not as long dated um, as, as the, the investment grade. And so we in the fixed income team need to look at all these assets um, and put them together in portfolios that match our clients' um, expected returns as well as their um, risk profiles. And so we do that within our different funds to blend the combination of these assets. Um, it's clearly not just going for the highest yield um, that you see. You need to recognize that for the additional yields you're getting, you're obviously taking on these risks and one needs to blend those together into a portfolio that meets um, all the different re return requirements as well as the, the risk profile. Yeah, uh, thanks, Gareth. It certainly seems like it's a bit more complex than, than what the normal person maybe thinks about. We'll obviously try and make it as simple as possible for you guys today and try and oversimplify some of these concepts. The interesting thing I've looked at over the last couple of years is to look at the historical returns that we've seen in the market over the last couple of years. I've put on a slide here where you can see the rolling one-year returns of two categories of funds that you may be very familiar with. The one is uh, in, in yellow is the, the average uh, income fund. It's a, a IB short-term category. And the other one is the multi-asset low equity category, which is a, a category often used in, very, uh, in a lot of living annuities. And what you can clearly observe from the graph here that there are typically long periods where cash underperform like in 2010 to 2015 relative to some riskier asset classes like this particular multi-asset asset class. And then we see something like over the last five years when cash actually outperformed their riskier assets. Now, the interesting thing for me is to follow the flows of money into these various categories. And what we, the bars I've put here is the total flows into the three income categories. It's money market income and multi-asset income minus all the flows into all the multi-asset categories. So where the bars are below the line and in red, net flows have gone into the multi-asset categories, i.e. the riskier categories, and above the line in gray, much more money has gone into the fixed income categories. And what you can see on, on the table, obviously, as cash has outperformed over the last couple of years, with a three to five quarter lag, a significant amount of money in the industry has gone into these fixed income categories. So the question for me is that, or maybe the question for Gareth is, we are all geniuses when we look at in, in hindsight and we can see where the, the best periods were over the last couple of years. I'm thinking about where is this picture going to end going forward and especially what we've seen over the last couple of months with the coronavirus into coming into not only South Africa, the entire world, what has been the impact that we've seen globally in, in the markets first before we get into South Africa? Sure. So, I mean, Peter, I guess the fact that we're, we're sitting doing a, a webinar kind of talks to the impact and we've got an audience out there and we wouldn't have done these type of events previously. And that reflects how coronavirus or the, the pandemic has affected all parts of, of the world. Um, and I guess that's the first point that the impact has been, been global. Um, and clearly, I mean, the, the first is a humanitarian impact. Um, the, the impact on people's lives um, and what's um, the hospitalizations and, and the deaths. But clearly um, for us in the fixed income market is, is what's happened to the economies um, and then what's the impact being on the fixed income markets. Um, so we've got a, a graphic up where we're just looking at GDP and I, I guess the point to be made here is that um, GDP has been massively affected, growth has been affected. And why is that? Well, I think it's fairly obvious is that, you know, the pandemic uh, is a health event, but clearly there's been um, uh, the, the steps taken to address the spread of the pandemic, effectively the lockdown and shutdown of 
more or less the global economy has a massive ramifications across the globe. So if we just look at the, the GDP forecasts, you can see in 2019, that's actually what um, GDP um, growth was across um, different um, the, the developed markets, emerging markets, um, and then we just highlighted South Africa there, which, I mean, just to make the point, obviously, that South Africa went into this crisis in a fairly weak position. But you can see what the IMF is forecasting for 2020, and it's, it's a massive fall. Um, and although expectations are that, obviously, you'll see growth coming through next year, clearly the, the balance that you're seeing is not going to offset um, the knock that you, you've seen here. Um, and so what has the response been? So I guess we can look at it two ways. One is, I mean, the fiscal response. Um, so what have governments done in the light of, of this and the economic impact? So clearly, um, governments have looked to spend more. Mm -hmm. And how do they do that? They borrow more. Um, and so what are they spending on? There have been bailouts, obviously, for certain industries offshore. Um, you look at the safety net that they put in to help um, people who are unemployed. We've seen it in our own country, um, looking to support those who've lost their jobs. Um, and that requires a lot of spending and clearly debt has gone up. So globally, what you're going to see is um, borrowing is going up um, much more than had been in the past. And obviously against the background or backdrop of, of lower growth. So that's the, the one effect on the fiscal side is, is more debt. Um, and then on the monetary side, you've obviously seen a, a massive response as well. So in global markets, um, what you've seen is those countries that have the ability to cut. So you saw the Fed cut interest rates um, to, to help the economy. Um, and then also a number of countries were at very low interest rates to start, certainly in the developed markets, um, and you've seen quantitative easing. Um, and what that is, is essentially um, buying bonds and other assets in, in the markets to inject liquidity into the markets. And all of those things have played out in the fact that if you looked at developed markets, actually you've seen bond yields continue to, to go much lower. Clearly, uh, you know, if you think about what happened in March, the, the massive set of equities, bonds were a safe haven and you've seen a rush to the, those markets. Um, so global bond yields um, pushing down as well as cash rates very low. And, and I guess we, we're going to chat about SA, but you know, similar things playing out here. Um, I guess one, against this backdrop, you're looking at that, it's also useful to think what are the biggest driver of fixed income assets and one needs to think about the inflation backdrop. Mm -hmm. So we've got another graphic that just looks at what's the um, inflation backdrop that this all happens against. Um, the chart looks at inflation over the last 20 years. And what you can see across this is it, it looks at advanced economies in the gray line, um, the, the yellow line emerging markets, and we've plotted SA, so you can see where we fit on there. And you can see a downward trend um, that's been intact um, over the last 20 years. And so inflation has been um, moving lower across this whole period. Um, and I guess the question is, given all that we've seen um, now, now, is there this risk of, of high inflation? And I, and I guess if, if one thinks about everything that's been going on, and um, we see li very little sign of, of an inflation problem um, coming. Now, some might argue that with the monetary um, stimulus you've seen and the fiscal response you've seen, that maybe inflation is going to be a problem coming down. And, and what I would say is that um, those same arguments were made post the financial crisis. So if you look at this chart and we look at 2009, um, exactly at that point, we had a similar monetary response, certainly. Um, and there were fears that inflation was going to be um, coming through. And what we saw, if you look at this chart, is actually that hasn't been the case um, at all. So I guess what we see in the fixed income markets is very low yields on offer, both on cash and bonds, but their inflation environment is relatively um, benign, um, certainly, and it would appear to be benign um, for the short to medium term, um, certainly. Yeah, and you've mentioned that South Africa obviously started this crisis on a, on a very weak foot, and I think we already entered a recession before the coronavirus came along. So we, if we turn to South Africa, how did all of these events unfold in South Africa? Sure. So, I mean, I would say March was a crazy month. Um, and, and so I think anyone in the markets, um, the volatility yeah. that we saw there, uh, certainly none of us had experienced. Um, if we think just of the, the bond market, um, bond yields um, kind of rose massively over that period. So, you know, um, nominal bonds rose over 3% um, sell-off. Um, and if you, if you think of inflation-linked bonds, um, got to, you know, at the, at the peak, um, some of those long dead inflation-linked bonds were off over 3%. You were getting almost 7% real inflation bond. Um, and so it was a bit of a crazy time, a massive sell-off. And so why was that sell-off going off? Obviously, there was the coronavirus and the pandemic, and people were grappling with um, what the effects of the, the lockdown would have. Um, and that's both globally and locally. 
Um, so you had a risk off event um, kind of globally, offshore markets risk off, and locally as well. And certainly we were grappling within our thinking. Um, remember, we were actually ahead of going into this crisis, we were actually long bonds, and we had a positive view um, on bonds. And we were grappling with, then with, well, what were the implications for, for South Africa and what would um, entail from the fiscal perspective? Because um, clearly um, the, the debt dynamics would not look good against this backdrop. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you had a risk off event, so you had a flight to, to safety. You saw equities having massive falls. Um, and, and to be fair, even though we had been positive on bonds, if you think about what most managers were doing is they were looking for liquidity. Um, and so that would be uh, the rush to liquidity. You essentially saw everyone trying to um, look to shore up their portfolios. So be that foreigners um, who were trying to sell their riskier assets, possibly SA bonds, so they were selling bonds. Um, within the, the local uh, market, you had um, investors who had derivative positions who had to post margin. And given the massive moves that you'd seen in, in these um, asset classes, large amounts of um, cash had to be placed on margin, and so you need to create liquidity. And where would managers do that? They look to do that with their government bonds, which are amongst the most liquid assets. Um, even managers ourselves who are positive on, on bonds or had allocations, they might have said, well, they were looking quite cheap. Given the fact in a multi-asset class funds, your equities would be falling faster than your assets, just simply rebalancing your portfolio to keep your positions in line would have meant that you would needed to be selling bonds. So who was buying bonds? And essentially from all parts, people were selling bonds and the banks um, were essentially just facing one-way traffic on bonds and, and looking to buy them. And if you think from the bank's perspective, they're having to fund the liquidity that managers are wanting, plus on their client side, given the impact of the, the lockdown, um, you know, those clients were drawing down on facilities that they had with the banks. So the banks were under a massive liquidity squeeze, um, and essentially that reflected in the pricing. So the pricing just spiked uh, massively because there was this rush for liquidity. And so what, what changed? And essentially then, like we'd seen offshore, we saw the Saab step in, and what we, we saw was, at first they cut interest rates, mm -hmm. but also importantly, um, what we saw was announced that they would actually look to provide liquidity to banks. And they did that in two ways. Um, they kind of allowed them um, some relaxation of some of the liquidity re regulatory requirements, plus they provided a number of facilities and cut the, co cut the cost of those facilities to allow the banks to provide liquidity to the market. And then importantly, we thought for the first time, we saw the SARP say that they would actually look to buy bonds mm -hmm. um, in the market and to address liquidity issues. And, Post that event, you saw bonds start to rally. Um, and so April was, was a, um, a very good month relative to what we'd, we'd seen in, in March. So I suppose, I guess we need to ask the question, what's happened in, in the local fixed income market? So we've got a graphic up here, which just looks at um, the real yields on um, bonds and cash. And we'll first just look at cash. And if we just look at this as the history of the, the last sort of nine or 10 years, we're looking at and shows the real cash return. So remember, we're looking at real returns here, which is the nominal return, less inflation. Mm -hmm. And you can see distinct periods here. So you can see up until um, post-financial crisis, should I say, from Jan 11 to about um, 15, you would have seen that we ran negative real cash rates. So you weren't getting paid a real return to hold cash. Whereas if you look, a big change occurred as we moved um, with the new governor um, into from January 2017 on to where we were before the crisis, where we ran much higher real cash rates. And why were we running higher cash rates? Well, essentially the Saab had moved to saying, actually we want inflation target or inflation expectations to be in the midpoint on inflation um, targeting band. So that's three to six. And so inflation expectations should be more around the four and a half percent level. Whereas what we'd seen um, in the past, certainly that period post financial crisis where the people expected and certainly inflation was sprinting at 6%. But the question, if you just look at the end there, is obviously that given the cuts that we've seen, kind of 250 basis points of cuts, obviously the real return on offer is, is negative now. And how does that compare to what you get on bonds? So we've just plotted the 10 year bond yield on the chart. And what you can see is this upward trend. And clearly we know the dynamics here, the fiscal dynamics and the impact on credit rating um, as, as playing out, out over the last couple of years. But what you can see then certainly in March, the massive spike, um, April, the massive rally. And just to highlight then the gap that where we sit with today. And if you look at that relative um, gap between cash and bonds, that's almost five and a half percent real that you're looking at. And I suppose the question then is, um, you know, that looks like a fairly compelling turn. It's a uh, compelling um, gap and you know, I, I suppose one might say, well, that looks quite attractive then. And should one think about holding some, some bonds? Um, another way just to look at the bond market is looking at the curve steepness. 
Um, so we've got another graphic here which just looks at the bond market itself. Um, and the purple line is what the bond yield curve looked like six months ago, and we've compared it to where it is now. And what you can see on the left there is obviously how the curve has been pulled down as cash rates have been cut. And what you can see at the back end is obviously um, the curve kicking up um, in, and how much wider it is than where it was um, not that long ago. So this massive risk premium that we're talking about um, you can, is reflected in, in this curve. So you know, I, I guess this is kind of telling us that you're offering, being offered a significant um, increased risk premium by holding bonds uh, versus cash. So Gareth, that certainly looks quite attractive if you just on the face or if you just look at the graphs and certainly there's some risk premium between cash and, and the bonds or the longer dated bonds. And I guess many of the questions also that we got from our clients was, and they've obviously realized there's some attractive risk premium available there, but what is the risk? Can the government default on that debt? So if you take some of the longer dated bond, what are the bonds? To offer that yield, what is the risk to you as an investor? For, for sure. I mean, so unfortunately, the, um, yeah, the, there's no such thing as um, riskless return and no free lunches. And so you're looking at that risk premium that you've been offered, and we, we can see it, and we can see it's the widest it's been, uh, but clearly that, that's not for nothing. Um, and so as you highlight, and, and I guess many clients have had questions about this, uh, isn't there a very big risk on bonds? And mm -hmm and um, what's the likelihood of a sovereign default. And clearly those risks have increased. Um, so no getting around that is certainly the position that we were in prior to um, pandemic. Certainly we, the position's a lot worse. And uh, the one point to that that I would just point out is obviously the returns on offer are a lot higher now. So the market is reflecting, it has repriced as we saw with those curves, is that a lot more has been priced in for the risks. So I think that's important to just remember is it's easy to see the risks. We must also just think of what, what are you being paid. Um, for those risks. So we've got another graphic here just looking at um, on the question of sovereign default and, and the potential for default. Um, we're looking at the left hand chart here is just looking at what the finance minister presented in his supplementary budget um, just a few weeks ago and looking at the trajectory of debt to GDP. Um, and, and so this is you can see what debt to GDP had been doing over the last few years and, and clearly we, we saw what was doing on bond yields and we've had the downgrades and the like and that was reflecting the, the fiscal weakness. Um, but pandemic is obviously um, kind of, I guess, globally and locally, obviously thrown a spanner in the works there with whatever trajectory was projected. So we had a supplementary budget to, to look at addressing the pandemic. And we had two different scenarios presented. Um, the one was the passive scenario, which essentially the, the Treasury painted as if we did nothing to address the trajectory we're on and the borrowing and the expenditure we've got, um, what does this picture look like? And as you can see, it, it is not a good scenario. No. Um, and in that world, um, yeah, for sure, you're on the, the road to ruin. Um, then they painted the, the active scenario, which is essentially Treasury's view as to the steps they're going to take to um, arrest this trajectory that we see. Um, and you can see what it's got, and clearly it, it's still, you know, it's a, let's not pretend that it's not a strained um, scenario, but um, certainly it looks a lot better than the alternative. Mm -hmm. um, and so what are they doing there? They're looking to address spending. Um, and in particular, um, and I guess the big challenge here is what you're going to cut on your expenditure and reining in that expenditure. And obviously public sector wages has been a big part of that, but it can't just be that. Um, and, and that's the alternative scenario they've presented um, at the supplementary budget. Now, I guess from my perspective, and if you look in the market and you look at commentators, I wouldn't say that there's anyone who's overly optimistic that the active scenario is definitely going to play out. Um, and so if you look at all the commentary, I guess it's been the same refrain is that South Africa has been very good at having all sorts of plans as to the things it was going to do, but it's been very poor at implementing any of those. And so the same question now arises. Um, we've seen, we've got the scenario, but are we going to see any changes? And, and the key here is not so much just cutting your expenditure or addressing the wage book, which obviously you need to do. But the key thing is growth. Um, and essentially this country needs growth for us um, to actually really make a big difference. And those are the structural reforms that need to be implemented. And we've talked a long time about this, but the key question here is, is there enough emphasis um, and a, enough um, a motivation now to actually start implementing those? And what I would say is certainly the tone of this um, supplementary budget was a lot stronger than we'd seen before. Um, and you know, certainly we'd be hopeful that some of those reforms be implemented. But the point is certainly that I don't think the market is necessarily priced for a rosy outcome on, on this, and that's important to bear in mind. The other point on sovereign default is to consider 
um, normally what defaults look like. And if you look at other defaults that occurred in my emerging market space, generally it's been countries that defaulted on their foreign currency debt. And why is that? Well, generally they have a large amount of foreign currency debts. Their local um, fixed income markets are not that developed, so they can't really fund in the local markets. And then they're faced with um, paying, having to pay amounts in foreign currency, and clearly the currency um, weakens and they can't afford to do that. If we just look to the right of the, the chart, we'll just look at South Africa's situation, which is quite different from a typical emerging market. Mm -hmm. And then most of our debt is locally based um, and in our own currency. So yes, there might be foreigners participating in the local market, but it's in rands. And so that is not a, a feature or the typical way that countries default is not really a feature in, in the South African market. Um, another question that also comes up is, well, who's funding the government? Surely no one's going to give them any money. Um, so we just put up uh, the results from the last auction, a nominal bond auction that we had just the other week. Um, and every week the government is having an auction where they're raising debt. And this just shows um, that auction. So on the left, you'll see the bonds that they were looking to raise. So it's a five year, 10 year, and a 15 year bond. Um, you can see the volume of bids. Um, and then in the, the allocated column shows how much they're issuing. So they're roughly raising six billion. They're going to be raising a bit more post the supplementary budget. And you can see that the bid to cover shows you the bids versus um, the allocated amount. And what you're looking at there, there were more bids um, than there were actually they were looking to raise. Now, obviously, the primary dealers who are required to bid, so the government is pretty certain that it will always get away its debt, but there are more bids coming from foreigners. So in this particular auction, there were, you know, the foreigners were um, very prevalent in the shorter than five-year bond, but there are market participants buying bonds at this time. So it's not like the government can't um, finance itself at, um, at this point in time. And then just to go to back, to my first point was we've obviously looked at all the, the possibilities of sovereign default, the negatives. Um, I think it's also important just to reflect on what's the alternative scenario um, and, and say, well, what could go right? And maybe not even what needs to really go right, but what could change the trajectory and at least give us hope that we're moving in the, the right way. Um, and, and so that would be some of those structural reforms we're talking about. So we've got a chart here just of looking at us compared to Brazil. Um, and it just makes a nice comparison to look at a country that probably found itself in a, a similar, if not worse, position. If you look at their debt to GDP numbers higher than ours, um, if you, uh, this chart goes back um, just over two years. Um, and you can see Brazil, which is currently rated lower than us, if you look at their yields, they were higher than ours. Um, and what made that change that happened around about um, October 2018 to the beginning of January, you can see those yields um, came down massively. And obviously, you had a new president elect and a new and finance minister, and they said they were going to address the structural reform um, issue that Brazil has, and particularly the pension fund reforms that were required. And you can see the massive rally that's occurred in Brazil subsequent to those announcements. Not that they've actually, I mean, had actually reformed um, or had done anything at that point in time, but the market was forward looking. So as long as the market gets convinced that the structural reforms are coming and they will be implemented, you can see a big move in the market because the market doesn't wait for them to happen at prices ahead. So if you look at that, that graphic, you can see currently where we are is that Brazil is yielding 2% less than South African bonds. And in fact, its debt metrics are, are worse than South Africa's. And so I guess that, I guess, would be the positive story on this. But the point also is that you don't necessarily need the rally to happen. You are being paid a, a big um, premium here. So even you know if things don't get particularly or a lot better and then we are now, you are being paid a, a lot for that. Kareth, you mentioned the, the massive global liquidity crisis actually that happened. Um, did, and, and as a result of that, the yield spiking globally, did that present an investment opportunity for us, maybe in some of our, our, our global bonds? And and how did it impact on the South African credit markets and, and how we price it in South Africa? Sure, Peter. So let's start with the, the international markets. Um, I've got a chart um, up here where we're just looking at high yield bonds and investment grade credit spreads. Um, and this is global markets. So we're looking kind of over the last 15 years or so. And we've got the whole history here with you can see what spreads did in the financial crisis. And then clearly at the end, you can see um, what occurred um, in, in March. Um, and you see that massive pickup in spreads. So, I mean, if you just step back to what we were talking about earlier on, on global markets and that liquidity crunch, but the reality is obviously with a shutdown in the economy, any name of, of company operating would have been affected. Um, yeah. If you want to think, I mean, clearly the obvious ones would be airlines. Um, you know, no, you're not flying. 
So, you know, the, the risks on those entities are, are massive. Um, I guess we haven't touched on the fact that you had an oil shock at the same time going on with all, all the, the pandemic, which obviously um, increased that. So if you look at the energy sector, for instance, with oil prices um, crashing down to $20 or whatnot, you can imagine what the risk profile looked. I mean, for, um, you know, the local audience here, obviously Sasol would be a, a case in point and, and anyone followed what's happened with the share price, you can see the impact there, but clearly also the bonds. So the bonds were priced for default during the, the course of March and obviously we've seen some recovery there. But as you play through your mind, the impacts of a shutdown, and we've all seen it in our own communities and, you know, it's, it's not just the big companies, but the small ones in particular, restaurants and the like, without question, the credit environment is a lot more risky. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, when we see that price move and that, that spike up in credit spreads, well, you know, you can explain what's happening there just from the risk profile is a lot higher. But I, I guess at the same time, there's a liquidity crunch, as I mentioned, that everyone was looking for liquidity. And, you know, credit markets globally are certainly more liquid than SA. But, you know, in a panic like this or a market event like this, clearly liquidity also becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. So what you do see is, a, is quite a big rally subsequent um, to that sell-off. And, and part of what was going on there was addressing liquidity, like we saw um, in, in the local market. I mentioned liquidity steps taken clearly in the global market that was at, had also going on. And particularly in the credit markets, um, you saw the Fed and you're looking at U.S. credit here um, injecting liquidity into the market. So they started buying um, corporate um, bonds, investment grade initially, mm -hmm. and then actually announced that they would buy high yield ETFs. Um, and so there was liquidity provided there. And you've seen that repricing going on. Um, within the market, you see the spreads come down just because uh, there was a buyer sort of want, almost a glass resort in, in those markets, um, which, yeah, obviously helped that. And so you mentioned, what have, we, what have we done or did we look to take advantage of that? So certainly in those funds that we have ability to take an offshore exposure, and we'll chat on our enhanced income fund just now, but it has ex some exposure to um, offshore and we look to buy some high yield credit. So before this period, we, we've been in investment grade and um, we've mentioned bond yields hadn't looked that attractive. So we've been um, in floating rate, investment rate credit, and we moved into some high yield credit as, as we saw the, the sell off and looked to take advantage of some of those higher, higher spreads. Um, follow through what we've seen in the international markets and, and we try and think, well, so given that backdrop, surely the same holds in South Africa. And no doubt the same does hold. So if you think about companies in South Africa, exact same effects. If you think of what's happened to the REITs, um, the, the retail investment um, companies or, or you know, shopping centers and the like, property offices, companies. property companies, um, you know, you've got no one transacting in those. Mm -hmm. um, we mentioned Sasol. Um, so you would have thought, well, you don't think, we know the credit risks are much higher. Um, and it, you don't have to be a genius to figure that out. But the question is, did we see the same price reaction? Um, and we've got a graphic up here that just looks at um, Cypher's corporate bonds. And we're looking here at kind of the credit spread you're earning um, on these bonds and looking at whether that spread changed. Um, and what you can see from this is about two thirds of the bonds have not repriced at all. Um, you, you had in, um, a fifth of the bonds um, weaken and, and then um, amazingly 12% strengthened. But I will caution here that the market is illiquid um, so some of those bonds that are strengthened, strengthened might have been very cheap to start with. So it's hard to um, kind of argue with that. But I think the main point he says many bonds hadn't repriced. And so the question is, well, does that seem correct? And I certainly on our side, we didn't think that was appropriate. So our fair value committee kind of through this period was watching this and looking at what was happening offshore and um, looking at the risks that were increasing um, and saw fit to reprice a number of our corporate bonds. And why is that? Well, if you think about our funds, we provide daily liquidity on a number of them, and we think it's important that those funds are fairly valued because you've got clients going in and out of those um, funds on, on a daily basis. Yeah, so whether clients are buying or selling, they need to enter or exit at a fair price. For sure. And, and obviously, if the assets are overvalued in the fund, then you would charge uh, an unfair amount. So you need to adjust it. No, exactly. So Gareth, then given the, the increased credit and liquidity issues in the market, how, how do you guys look at our funds and how do you position the funds to make sure you minimize that risk as far as possible? So that's a good, a good question. And my answer to that is we do exactly what we've always done. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like this happens and we change what we do. We've got a process that we, we've run consistently for, for 20 years. Um, it's the same credit process informed with our, our um, parent company in, in the UK, which they, they use M&G Investments. 
um, we've got access to um, their expertise, both on um, fund asset valuations as well as on their credit side. And so we leverage off that. But we run the same process that we've been, been running. And what does that process entail? Um, it's, it's exactly addressing that credit risks, the risks of default, as well as liquidity risks. So we um, build a portfolio um, bearing in mind that we expect default events to happen. We don't want them to happen and we do our best with our credit team to avoid them and pick names that aren't going to default, but they do happen and we have to be humble enough to say that we can get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And so how does one protect one's portfolio kind of against that? And the key thing in a, in a fixed income portfolio is diversification. Mm -hmm. And so even the names that you're most bullish on and you think are the best names, the, the key here is because you're not getting paid any upside is to manage the downside and you do that with diversification. Um, and so if we just look, I've given an example here of our exposures within our Prudential Enhanced Income Fund. Um, and we're just looking at kind of the spread amongst the, the local assets and the credit names there. And if you look on the left, it's just the sector split. Mm -hmm. So you can see kind of the diversification amongst sectors going on there. Um, we've broken out the financials because obviously that's the biggest sector that we're looking at. And then on the financials, you can see we've got exposure, which is quite well diversified amongst the, the big four banks and then some other financials in there. So again, not just betting the house on, on one particular name. Mm -hmm. And then also because it's quite topical and we've seen obviously in the press quite recently and, and we know that the land bank has defaulted. Obviously we, we've got AXA, um, which you know, we've got airlines not flying. So it's quite difficult to run an airport's business without any customers. Mm -hmm. um, but we've spoken out that SOE split. And again, there we'd like to think that we're relatively well diversified within that sector as well. Um, importantly, also just to highlight the exposure to the big banks, um, yeah, it's 26% of, of fund, and we think it's important to diverse away, diversify away from just having big bank exposure, not just, um, you know, certainly it does provide liquidity, but also to provide additional return, but also to address the probability of, of default within any one of those entities. So Gareth, when you look at the valuations on offer in the local fixed income market, and, and we've clearly seen a massive difference or a gap between cash and, and the longer bonds on offer, can you talk us through the valuation opportunities that make you guys excited and, and how you would walk this fine line between earning additional yield for our clients, but also protecting them against any defaults? Sure. So I think importantly, what you mentioned there is walking that, that line. And I think it's important within our funds, but also our mandates and certainly for clients to think about, you need to know what your risk tolerance is mm -hmm. when you build a portfolio. Um, and, and that's the, the key thing. So if we just think, we, we've got a graphic up here looking at the global in market, yeah. fixed income market, I think that's a good place to start. And it just looks at the real returns on offer amongst um, different fixed income markets. And we're looking particularly in developed markets here. And, and I, I guess from our perspective, certainly, if you're looking at real returns, there's not a lot of offer here. I mean, you're not actually getting paid a real return to buy offshore fixed income or certainly developed market fixed income. So that's not looking um, a particularly favorable in environment, certainly from our perspective um, on, on the global side. Um, if we come then to the local market um, and we, we look at valuations and we, we generally like, um, we, we use the slide and clients of ours who are familiar with um, right. us using this, this way of looking at valuations. Um, and we look at the different asset classes. Um, here we start our cash on the left and we look at the real return on offer. And currently cash is giving you a negative real return. You saw that on one of the earlier charts. Um, so, you know, we, we've kind of, you can see that the gray dot sort of says what we think through time you should be paid. And clearly, you know, cash is not looking very attractive on, on that basis, as we pointed out. As you move to the right, um, we look at kind of inflation in bonds and government bonds. And what stands out here, obviously, is that you do look like you've been paid a significant um, premium. So you're getting around about four, four or above 4% four real return on offer from these assets. But as mentioned earlier, it's not without risk. Um, right. And yes, we've talked about some of those risks. And clearly also just important to, to mention, um, not just the sovereign default and those kind of credit risk priced into or sovereign default risk price into the market, but also the volatility of the instruments. Mm -hmm. So one needs to bear in mind that if one buys a government bond or inflationary bond, that price can move around a lot, mm -hmm. um, depending on what interest rates are doing. But we're looking at a time period here, kind of on a medium to long-term time horizon. And we think those assets look quite compelling. On, on the bond side, the government bonds, um, we're looking at a 10-year point. Obviously, we mentioned how steep the curve was. Mm -hmm. Longer dated um, bonds, we think, are even looking more compelling um, against this backdrop. And then compare that to the world on the, the right, uh, which you're not very being offered very much. And we do think that certainly one should be thinking about um, investing in um, in some bonds. And we're not saying bet the whole house on it and move your portfolio out of cash into bonds, but you certainly, at 
kind of the gap between these two should encourage one to think about, should I take some risk here yeah. to enhance my returns? And, and so we can have a look at certainly how we've changed our positioning in some of our funds. So we, we picked the enhanced income fund here, and we thought um, we'd just show you what the fund looked like um, at the, the end of December and how it's positioned at the moment. And the point being that we're, we've looked to add some of these uh, more attractive assets to the fund, in particular the bonds. So if we just start on the left of that chart, you can see the cash in the fund has fallen from just over 50% to about 44%. So we, we've utilized some of that cash to buy some other assets. So what have we bought? As you move to the right, you'll see SA bonds. So we, we've added roughly about um, 3 or 4% to SA bonds, um, given the returns that we see on offer. Importantly, just looking at those bars, you'll see we've highlighted a little dashed line which looks at um, how much of um, the duration or exposure to interest rate risk we'd hedged. So if you look at the end of December, about half of our bond holdings had been hedged, meaning that we were not taking um, interest rate risk on those bonds. Although we held bonds, the interest rate risk had been hedged out with swaps. You'll see uh, more recently at the end of May, we'd cut that um, quite, quite a lot, meaning we were taking even more duration risk. So we've allocated bonds and we've increased the sensitivity of those, um, those holdings to interest rates. And if we move to the far right, you'll see we've allocated to offshore. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that we took advantage of some of that pricing in the high yield market. And you can see we've moved from being 100% in investment grade um, into 85-15 split into high yield investment grade. Also, just to point out that that's all hedged back into to SA RAND. Thank you very much, Gareth. And I think if I look at the questions that we received before the time, certainly the most questions was around what can I expect going forward from my fixed income portfolios for my clients? Clearly, um, advisors and clients are, are very worried about returns, especially those clients drawing income for retirement. So is there any type of indication that you can give them about what are the future returns you can expect from, from the various funds? Sure. I mean, it's always a difficult question to answer. Um, so what are the future returns be in it? And I, I guess, you know, if we, we, we knew, we'd tell you this is exactly what it's going to be and we'd we'd all be retired, right? So it's very difficult to kind of say what their ret returns will be, but uh, I think we can talk valuations and we can talk about what we think the prospective returns look like. And I guess in the fixed income market, um, one of the things you, you can do is look at current yields. So if you buy some of these assets now, what is your portfolio yielding? And then you can make some assumptions around that. So in, in this graphic, what we've tried to do is kind of look at our suite of fixed income products that, that we've got and look at what the funds were yielding um, a year ago and compare that to what they're yielding now as a starting point. So um, just to put it in context, if you look at the, the left there, it looks at the repo rate and you can see kind of over the course of the year that you, you've had 3% um, worth of interest rates cuts coming through. So you would expect that to filter through the market. Mm -hmm. Clearly the bulk of those cuts happened um, more recently. Mm -hmm. um, and I mentioned the two and a half percent kind of that we've recently seen. So that will filter through as, as we, we go. If we look at the money market fund there, you can see you know, that yield at the moment is just under 5%, and it's probably going to come down slightly as mm -hmm. notes within that fund continue to reprice, given um, the most recent um, cuts that we've had. Um, but you, you're getting roughly about 5%. Um, income fund, you can see you're getting a pickup there. Again, that fund's not looking to take um, any duration risk per se, but it's it's kind of um, got exposure to a number of different credit assets mm -hmm. and you're getting an additional pickup for that. But you can see how that yield has come down and that's with yeah. the rate cuts filtering through. Um, we then the fund that we've just been look at it, looking at, the Enhanced Income Fund, which is about 6.5% um, uh, yield that you've got at the moment. But importantly for that fund versus what we've just, the other funds we've just talked about, as I mentioned, it holds some bonds. Mm -hmm. So it's got some duration risk, which is about two years duration um, most recently. So that gives you a sense of kind of how sensitive, it's to, how sensitive it is to interest rate moves. So if interest rates, for instance, were to move up by a percent, um, you'd see a capital loss of, of 2%. And so you'd have to deduct that off that yield and vice versa. If yeah. interest or yields fall, you're going to get an additional 2%. And that gives you a range, I would say. Yeah. Likewise, as you move to the bonds, and interesting out of the whole product suite, this is the one where it's gone from yielding 9.5%, you're getting over 10.5% mm -hmm. now. So it's the one where the yield's actually gone up, and we've talked about some of what's been priced there. So you, you've got a yield on, on the bond fund um, that's almost 11% um, versus a money market yield uh, which is around about 5%. And as we've highlighted there, you've got a, a gap now at about 6% between those two funds versus only 2% kind of a year ago. Mm. And obviously on the bonds, you've got the duration effect there. So potentially, if you think the duration is around about seven years on our bond fund, if 
um, yields on those bonds which are at 8%, you're looking at another 7% 7 return. So you're looking at 18% return in the best case. Well, not a best case, but if you had a rally, and if you had the sell-off, vice versa, you'd be, be taking 7% off that. So you, you're probably looking at around about 4%, um, 4 or 5% return. And so I guess that hopefully gives a sense of, of what the likely returns will, will be. No, thanks a lot for that. And, and I think it would give clients some kind of indication of what you can expect going forward. Um, I think let's leave it there for now and turn to the questions that we've received from the audience and see how many of those questions we can address for our clients. So Gareth, let's turn to some of the questions which I've got here on my screen and uh, we'll see if we can cover some, some of them as they come along. The first question I've got here is uh, saying your enhanced income fund has underperformed over the last two to three years. Do you care to comment about that? Sure, Peter. I mean, it's a, it's a good point, obviously. I mean, that has been the case. I think important to make the point there is you need to compare to what you're looking at and which type of funds you're comparing to. It's obviously quite a big sector. Um, but you know, how, if you think of what we showed on, on the slide with enhanced income and the assets we hold in there, you can see it's not hasn't just been a cash fund. Mm -hmm. So we've looked to add different assets. So we've had bonds, we've had some property, inflation-linked bonds, and if you've looked at the performance of those assets over the last sort of few years, you would have seen they underperformed cash, obviously. And, and so that's done well for those funds that were just in cash and, and just holding that. And you know, that's sort of walked under the bridge for investors now. Um, you need to look at what the prospective returns are um, for those asset classes. And as I think we, we demonstrated um, previously, is that we do have some exposures that are not to those, those asset classes. And we think kind of going forward, obviously the returns then from those asset classes look quite attractive. So for any investor, um, I, I suppose it's having a look at um, kind of going forward now, what do you think those funds will deliver? And certainly our fund is designed um, to take advantage of some of the, those assets now, which we think should definitely perform a lot better going forward. So, I mean, yes, the performance wasn't um, great um, versus cash for the last two years. And, and we can, you know, we've, we've kind of showed what's been happening in those assets, but going forward, I, I think definitely kind of a much, attract, or much more attractive proposition um, now. And I guess it also speaks to that difference that we said the higher yields on bonds versus the near zero on, on cash that you can definitely get in real terms. Definitely. But a question here from Edward Irons asking, what are the chances of hyperinflation in South Africa due to the massive printing of rands at the moment? So I think we did talk about inflation um, right up front. Um, and we talked about the benign inflation environment and obviously um, if we looked at where inflation is printing currently in South Africa, quite low. But I think what we're talking here is a longer term impact and, and what is the likelihood um, that inflation spirals, spirals out of control. And obviously there are always concerns, given we spoke about the debt situation of the country, that possibly one way the country could um, seek to get its way out of that trouble would mm -hmm. be to inflate its way out of the trouble. Obviously you've got nominal bonds paying a fixed um, rate and then you just um, increase inflation to, to help address that. Um, and, and the point I would make here is that we have a very credible central bank, which is independent. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had that in place now um, for, for 20 years. Um, and the market takes a lot of comfort and certainly we take a lot of comfort mm -hmm. from that. Um, and, and so that's important. And certainly um, from our perspective, um, we don't see that as, as a high risk um, going forward. Um, at the margin, one might argue, um, you, you might want to make the point as well that the, the debt that SAIF has issued, a lot of it is nominal, but there's also a fair amount that's issued in inflation linked bonds. Mm -hmm. And one item on the inflation linked bonds, obviously, is you can't inflate your way out of the problem uh, because those play the cost adjusts with inflation. Uh, but for sure, there's more nominal debt out there, but uh, that's just another um, item that I guess would keep the government honest, uh, I suppose, to yeah. some extent. Um, so do we think there's a, a risk of hyperinflation? Um, it, it's certainly not in, in our spectrum of of probable outcomes that we, we see. Okay, thanks. We have a question from Chris de Leroux asking, what impact will further downgrades have, I guess, on our, on our bond markets? Sure, so I mean, downgrades, I, if I think about it, we've been talking about um, downgrades, in particular Moody's downgrades, it, it seems for years. Um, I mean, for just to make the point, obviously we, we had the, the Moody's downgrade um, mm -hmm. occur um, and it was a bit of a non-event non um, actually. Um, and, you know, so we, we talked about all the flows that were going to happen and what would happen to pricing and um, the, the downgrade occurred and actually bonds rallied post, post the, the downgrade, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. um, but what does it mean for future downgrades? And I, I guess the, I, I would say that certainly um, we've spoken about the backdrop and the fiscal backdrop and we've had comments just in the last week from some of the rating agencies. 
um, which talked, you know, kind of to, to kind of the outlook and prognosis. Obviously, we talked about the supplementary budget and what the, the debt dynamics could be and whether we implement those structural reforms mm -hmm. we were talking about. Um, and so you've seen the rating agencies, I think at least two of them have a sort of negative outlook from where they are. Uh, and one which has us at the lowest rating, which is a double B minus, I think it is, is stable. Um, so yes, there's potential that you could have more downgrades. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we would make the point um, is that, you know, the, the backdrop, we've spoken about the backdrop and the market is aware of this. And, and as we talked about the, the debt dynamics and people's expectations of where that would be, certainly I, I don't think it's, you know, re it's reflecting quite a negative environment. And so we would argue that a lot is already priced into those markets um, or into the, the bond market. Um, and so does a, a downgrade have an effect per se? Not clear exactly. Um, you might want to argue that a lot is already priced in for those downgrades. Okay, thanks. There's a question from Marco Malley here about the 10-year yields appear to be ticking up towards the 10% level again. Is that an indication of a new assessment on SA sovereign debt by foreigners potentially, or is it just a temporary thing? Yeah, it's always difficult to say what's happening in the short term. So, I mean, you know, um, just in the last few days, you've seen bond yields spike up uh, 50 basis points or half percent. Mm. Um, and, you know, the volatility, certainly that's not the volatility we saw in March where, where bond yields were moving around. You know, you were talking about that every day for a number of days. Mm. Uh, but I, I think, you know, we, we talked about kind of the potential returns on offer um, from bonds. And I did mention there that that comes with volatility. And some of that volatility is exactly this, is that you're likely to see bond yields move around in quite big moves. Mm. It's hard to say what's driving that one way or, or the other. Um, and for sure, it might be the case that, you know, it's, it, we'll try and make a story as to what's driving. Why is, it, why is it moved out in just the last few days, 50 basis points? Is it something to do with bond supply? Um, you know, all these things. When, when we actually look at it, it's very hard to, to tease out what, what that is. Um, again, you're getting paid a big risk premium for taking on um, the volatility, um, is what I'd say. Yeah, I guess that's where, where clients need to understand with all the uncertainty in the markets and, and short-term news flow, you'll see a lot of volatility in the market. And the, the challenge is to look through that and say, what does the longer-term valuations offer you? And are those long-term risks worth taking? Exactly. So in the short term, you know, who knows where, where things go. Mm. Things go. If you look at our valuation process, we're looking on a, a medium to longer term basis. And we, we think um, it, on, on that view that you, that you win. Yeah. There's a question here from Zuki. Can you give us a sense of the, the costs associated with hedging in the fund? And I, I guess it speaks to duration hedging maybe or currency hedging. Yeah, I mean, I guess in the fixed income world, um, you know, hedging if we use swaps and the like, I mean, I wouldn't say there's a lot of costs um, to, to do that. So certainly um, in the fixed income space, um, in, you know, moving our duration or affecting our duration, the costs around those and the, the instruments that we've got there, um, there's not, a, a, not expensive, mm. to put it that way. Um, certainly uh, in different asset classes, certainly the cost of, of hedging can be quite prohibitive. So it's definitely something you need to monitor and make sure it doesn't eat up your portfolios return, sure. especially in a low, lower return world. Sure, but certainly I would say the, the derivatives that we use in, in the fund, um, you know, they're, they're not costly and, and eating okay. into those returns. It, certainly any um, decision we make as to use them will obviously factor in what's the cost and also the cost in trading these things um, and, and the liquidity in them. Okay, there's a question here from Anonymous asking, considering that there's a potential market correction looming, how are the income fund and enhanced income fund set up to protect client portfolios? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the point obviously assumes there is a market cor correction, um, and we've talked about what the valuations look like. So we focus on the valuations and look at what we're getting paid versus our long-term range, and, and when we look at that, um, you know, we, you know, it's hard to say that there is going to be a market correction and which way is that going to move? So we base our decisions on what we think the, the medium to longer term prospects are. Um, okay. All right. Thank you very much, Gareth. Uh, it's certainly been, been very useful hearing your insights into all of these various questions. And, and certainly when things are so uncertain, uh, one always appreciates speaking to the experts in, 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 in these asset classes. So from our side, thank you very much for all of you attending today. We really do appreciate your time that you spent uh, sitting in and watching this webinar and obviously also your support um, to our business during these times. What I can say is after this webinar, within the next one or two days, you'll get a copy of the presentation that we shared during the Gareth's questions.
and you'll also get a copy of the video uh, feed that you can maybe use to watch again or maybe show your clients. So from our side, thank you very much for, for your time and thanks for attending. Thank you.